Hello, I'm Thomas the Hermit. I'm a man of prayer and I'm on social media. There's a Facebook group called The Humble Holy Laity, as well as a YouTube channel called The Humble Holy Laity. But this is my own channel called Thomas the Hermit and it is my main channel. I am talking today about the illusion of control, that we think we have control over our lives, and also I'm talking about cycles, all the many different cycles that are in life. I'm going to start off with an old um, hippie song. You know, I'm not really a hip, hipster, I'm more of a hermit, but I'm going to sing this part of this to you, and I think you'll know what I'm talking about. To everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn, turn. And a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die. A time to plant, a time to reap. A time to kill, a time to heal, a time to laugh, a time to weep. Of course, that's the famous song by the birds. But some people may not know that that is actually written in Ecclesiastes, a book in the Bible. And I'm going to read that to you now. This is from Ecclesiastes starting in chapter 3. There's an appointed time for everything, and a time to every affair under the heavens, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot the plant, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to be far from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. You know, Ecclesiastes is a very beautiful reflection. I'm going to read a little bit of the beginning. You know, we need to get a little bit of flavor of what Ecclesiastes is all about. Vanities of vanities, says the preacher. Vanities of vanities, all things are vanity. What profit has man from all the labors which he toils under the sun? One generation passes and another comes, but the world forever stays. The sun rises and the sun goes down. Then it presses on to the place where it rises. Blowing now towards the south, then towards the north. The wind turns again and again, resuming its rounds. All rivers go to the sea, yet never does the sea become full. To the place where they go, the rivers keep on going. All speech is labored, there's nothing man can say. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear filled with hearing. What has been, that will be. What has been done, what will be done. Nothing is new under the sun. Even the things of which we say, see, this is new, has already existed in the ages that preceded us. There's no remembrance of the men of old, nor of those come. Will there be any remembrance among those who come after them? Okay, so that is the beginning of the book of Ecclesiastes. And we hear, you know, these words about that there are cycles and that there are things that are occurring over and over again. I'm talking about the illusion that we have of control. And why is that important? Well, one of the things that happens is under the illusion that we're in control, we oftentimes find ourselves trying to force things to happen that won't change. And, and that's not a good place to be. And that also, you know, I mean, that's going to lead towards anxiety, very, very heightened anxiety, 
It's not going to lead to a person who is reflected, to a person who is centered, to a person who is grounded. Learning to um, deal with the changes in our lives is, is a healthy spiritual place to, to exist in. But you can't do it if you have the illusion that you're in control. I'm starting off by saying you're not in control. And I'm going to turn over here to the letter of James. And we're looking at chapter 4, starting on verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we shall go into such and such a town, spend a year there doing business, and make a profit. You have no idea what your life will be like tomorrow. You are a puff of smoke that appears briefly and then disappears. Instead, you should say, if the Lord wills it, we shall live to do this or that. But now you are boasting in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. That's from James chapter 4, verse 13. Now, I'm not trying to get all biblical on you. What I'm trying to show you is that from the Apostle James, we get a little bit of a sensing that we're not in control. You know, there was an old saying, you know, my grandmother was from uh, Oklahoma, and she was quite a woman, you know. She used to go squirrel hunting with her husband. This is a family story. And the husband would say, go and shake the tree. But she didn't like doing that. So she started telling him, no, you go shake the tree, I'll shoot the squirrel. And she was a dead shot. That's a true story. But we, we also used to say something back in Oklahoma, which was, um, if the Lord wills and the creek don't rise. Of course, the idea is that if there's this uh, thunderstorm or whatever, and the creek rises and it shuts down the road. But they also got that passage of scripture, you know, if the Lord wills. See, we get that from James. If the Lord wills. We are not in control. This is a particular level of awareness that is important for the contemplative. Why do we hold on to the idea that we're in control? Well, we do it because it makes us feel secure. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I do not have some semblance a feeling that I'm in control. After all, you know, it's kind of scary to feel that you're at the mercy of everything that is outside of you. It is true that we are at the mercy of everything that is outside of us, but we don't have to, like, make it our dead focus. We don't have to be so focused upon it that we get depressed. This doesn't mean that you can't try to do things. This doesn't mean, you know, some people may say, well, if I'm not actually in control, then why should I even try to do anything? Or why should I try to make a business or make plans to do something? I mean, after all, something might happen. Well, it's true that something can happen to come in to interfere, but, you know, we should still make plans and do things. Uh, just because we're not absolutely in control, you know, this is an aspect of humility, recognizing that in the end you're not actually in control. The objective reality of the world can oftentimes encroach into our lives, into our plans, into everything that we are trying to do. That objective reality can really change and disrupt what is going on within our lives. But we would do a whole lot better if we would remember that we're not in control. You know, things happen in life that disrupt our plans. I want you to reflect on the past. How many times you set out to do one thing only to find out that you were not capable of doing it. Or you didn't have the gifts to do it or you could not make it happen. How many times does that happen? Doesn't that happen more often than you would like to think? Many, many times that you set out to win but you lose? 
You know, these are all aspects of learning that you're not in control. I'm going to read a very famous prayer that was made famous, of course, by Alcoholics Anonymous. Of course, I'm talking about the serenity prayer. The serenity prayer is an excellent prayer that is used by recovering alcoholics to remind themselves not to be caught up in the idea that they are in control and to make effort if they can. So let's, let's pray the prayer and let's look at it. This is the full form of the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. I'm going to take this reflection a little bit further. We talked about the serenity prayer. Um, there's an old saying, let go, let God. That's a good one. Um, I'm also going to say different strokes for different folks. You know, we have an illusion of control over others as well. Now, this is even more sinister than thinking that you're in control of, of the outside world. Thinking you're in control of other people is another really, really bad problem that we have. Um, I want to point out something very, very important. You know, we talk about the differences between the male and the female psyche. Do you realize that men can never understand how women think and women can never understand how men think? And did you realize that there are also, within that paradigm, there's even more differentiation? You know, there are creative thinkers and logical thinkers, and they conflict with each other. There's emotional thinkers, and they conflict with logical thinkers. You know, there, there's many, many different paradigms and approaches and conceptions about life. And feeling or believing that you're in control of others is, is a, you know, very, very bad idea. And you need to kind of correct that type of a thinking. As well as, as thinking that everyone has to think the way that you do. Now, I'm not going to expand this into the realm of the way that some of these theologians approach that, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that sin is not sin. No matter what your perspective or how you're looking at things, there is an absolute in the world. There's one absolute. Capital G-O-D is the one absolute. So you can have perspectives and you can have thoughts and you can have ways of looking at things, but if you're violating the way that God set out reality, then you are going against something that is not relative, but absolute, okay? I'm talking about like the Ten Commandments, or the Orthodox teachings of the Catholic Church, or what has also been ascribed as natural law, you know? And then there's some things that even cross cultural boundaries, you know, like Thou shalt not kill. You know, murder is a sin everywhere. Stealing is a sin. There are things that are built upon a rock. And there's other things that are on shifting sands. But when we go in and we say that everything is relative, we have made a huge mistake. To close out this teaching, what I'm going to do is we're going to look at that passage in Ecclesiastes again the one that was made famous by the birds. There's an appointed time for everything and a time for every affair under the heavens, 
a time to be born and a time to die. Do you have control over that? Now there's some people who want to have control over a time to die, uh, so-called euthanasia. But as a good Catholic Christian, do you have control over when you will die? Or when you will be born? A time to kill and a time to heal. You sound very controversial. But when we're looking at the entire fabric of life, we see different things. In the last passage on 9, it says, A time of war and a time of peace. And we don't like to think of such things. But you know, since I've been born in 1962, we were in the Korean War, then we went to the Vietnam War, then we went to the Cold War, as you know, now we're in the war against terrorism. You know, to think that that there's a time for war and a time for peace, I mean, it's, it's objectively true. Now, I don't think we like war, but there's an objective truth there. And then that means there is a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to weep and a time to laugh. You know, we can apply that to prayer directly. We like it when Jesus is just blessing our socks off, and we get very, very unhappy really, really quick when things aren't going our way or when things become very difficult. Okay, so what do we have? A time to laugh and a time to mourn. A time to seek and a time to lose. You ever look, looked for something and didn't find it? You ever prayed, you know, St. Anthony help me find something and you didn't find it? You ever had to, like, give up? And other times you, you were like the woman who found the gold coin by sweeping the house, as is recorded in the Gospels. A time to rend and a time to sow. Very powerful image. A time to be silent and a time to speak. Some people think they need to speak all the time. They say a wise man speaks very little. There's a time to speak. There's a time to be silent. Right now in the church, we're in a time to speak. If things get worse, it'll be a time to be silent. A time to love and a time to hate. We really don't like that passage, a time to hate. You know, I had to come to grips with the fact that my father was a narcissist and that my relationship with him was poisonous. So I had to learn how to call a spade a spade and say, this man acted out of evil motive in my regards. To love in a time to hate, and I already covered a time of war and a time of peace. There are many, many things that happen in life. There are many possibilities. There are tragedies. There are things that happen. There are things that are outside of your control. There's a time when you open a business there's a time when your business fails. A time that you're the bell of the ball, as they say. And there's another time when you may be the outcast. There's all sorts of things that happen in life. Today, I'm speaking about the illusion of control. We're not really in control. This is an important reflection. I ask you to take it to heart, and I ask you to apply it to your prayer life. This is Thomas the Hermit. Say a prayer for me. I am praying for you, and I will talk to you later.